Towards the end of last year, I preached a Sunday morning service at a church, and after the service, I stood with the pastor of that church, and a man came up and was talking to us, good man, gracious man, a Christian man, and he was talking about temptation, and he said to the pastor and myself, he said, I'm sure that being in the ministry, you don't get temptations like other men. Well, I always take a moment to think about what someone asked me a question. As a young man, I'd be very quick to respond, and I've had to learn to take a pause just to think about what's been said before I reply. And before I answered, the pastor jumped in with the same response I would have given myself. Well, in the ministry, we have temptations just like every other person, and many more besides. It made me realize that possibly a subject that's not so much understood today and we don't talk about so much is the temptation to sin. It's also something I think about personally as a man. I turned 49 in March. So on my next birthday, God willing, if I'm spared to next March, I will turn 50. And do you know that David is thought to have been 50 years of age, around that age, when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. We read in uh, the epistle to Timothy, Paul speaks of youthful lusts, and we tend to make the mistake of thinking that certain lusts apply only to the young. And yes, there's certain lusts that are stronger in youth than others, but the scripture warns very clearly that him who thinks he stands Take heed, lest he fall. And we're going to turn our attention in just a moment to the chapter that we read together in Genesis chapter 39. I'm sure it's a chapter familiar to most of us, an account that we've grown up with. We're going to look at this afresh this evening. We're going to look at this subject of, the temp of temptation, with Joseph the tempted slave. As we look at here, we need to understand that the temptation we're speaking of isn't temptation that you sometimes see in the scriptures concerning testing. This is the straightforward temptation to sin. And when we read together from the epistle of James, chapter 1, we read verses 13, 14, and 15, which say, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. These verses give us an answer, don't they, to those heretics who deny that Jesus had a human nature because Jesus was tempted by Satan. So therefore, he must have been a man, because if he was simply divine, God cannot be tempted to sin. But neither tempts he us to sin. And it might seem a strange thing for James to write, until we think of how sin entered into the world with Adam and Eve. And after they fall, what did they do? We read in Genesis chapter 3 from verse 12 that the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So Eve, the first one to sin, says, The serpent made me do it. Adam, the second one to sin, says, the woman made me do it, but it's your fault, God, because you gave her to me. What a shameful thing for Adam to say. What a shameful thing. And, you know, it reminds us of the words of Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? When you read of the account of David, the man after God's own heart, David, who is inspired to write such beautiful things about God's law, and about God himself, such insights, prophetic insights, we might say, he was inspired to write. When you turn to the end of that chapter, you find him communicating with Joab, 
and saying, don't be troubled about this. These things happen in war. He thought his scene could be covered. It could be hidden. My friend, when you sin, it's your fault. When I sin, it's my fault. God doesn't hold Satan accountable for your sin. He doesn't hold the evil spirits accountable for your sin. He doesn't hold your parents accountable for your sin, your children accountable for your sin, your husband, your wife accountable for your sin, the world accountable for your sin. He account holds you accountable for your sin because you and I, when we sin, as we read from James, <clears throat> it's where lust has been conceived and we're drawn away of our lusts and enticed. And when it's finished, it brings forth death. That tells us we don't even need the devil to tempt us. With the old man within, we can tempt ourselves to sin. If we don't seek to kill lust and don't seek to ensure that certain things aren't fed, they will boil up until we sin. I want to turn our attention to this chapter concerning Joseph, the tempted slave. Base our thoughts under three headings. If ever a man had a reason to boil up into sin, it's Joseph. The older I get, the more I read this chapter, the more I feel for Joseph in this temptation, the more I wonder at the grace given to him to overcome it. And our first heading this evening is Seductive Excuses for Sin. The second is a superb example to avoid sin. And our final thought is the shameful event which followed. Well, firstly then, seductive excuses to sin. You and I, we can excuse sins in all sorts of ways. But I'd like to use Joseph's life as a bit of an example for some of the excuses that are used today for sin and how really they don't form any meaningful reason for sin or justification for sin at all. And the first seductive excuse he might have used was his family situation. Joseph's family situation was less than ideal. His father, Jacob, committed polygamy, which, exacerbated, which was further exacerbated by favoritism. We might have thought that Jacob would have avoided making the same mistake as his parents, Isaac and Rebekah, who made that mistake of one favouring Isaac, um, <clears throat> sorry, Isaac favoring Jacob and Isaac favoring Esau and Rebecca favoring J Jacob. I'll get it right in a minute so the old tongue's not working this evening too well. Apologies for that. We would have thought, well, he learned that mistake. He didn't just repeat the mistake, he, he did it with interest by showing blatant favoritism towards Joseph and Rachel when returning to meet with Esau, putting the older ones at the front, the cannon fodder, the dispensable ones, we might call them, the ones who'd be more likely to be slain and keeping Joseph at the rear. The polygamy was against the order of God. God's ordained one woman for one man in marriage. And every time we read of it in the Old Testament, it's unhappy. Every time we see it, they're never a happy situation with polygamy. But this was further exacerbated by, Joseph, by Jacob providing Joseph with his coat of many colours. There's a verse in Proverbs I think I might make up as a sign in our house at home. Proverbs 15, verse 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Now, when it was my birthday in March, we decided to celebrate it by going to the butcher and ordering four sirloin steaks from the butcher, and he cuts them nice, about an inch thick, and I fry them nice, medium rare. And I have to say, this year, they were the, some of the nicest steaks we've ever had. They were sweet. They melted in the mouth. I like steak. I think most of us men, we like steak. We like roast beef and all these things. They epitomize, don't they, uh, food. And, and high living, and all these things. Proverbs says better a salad. 
better a vegetarian meal than having roast beef, a sumptuous fare? If with the salad you've got love, and with the riches you haven't. Oh, how true that is. My dad saw a sign in Ireland years ago. He wished he'd bought it. Home is the place where you get, get cuddled. What a lovely description of a home. That is not now, that's home, not church. Come on, I've had to tell you last time I was here, I think, Peter, steady on, steady on. My glasses steam up quite easily. It's good to have love in a family. It's good to have love. Husbands are to love their wives. We're to love our neighbors as the Lord's people. We need love in the home. We live in a day of hatred today. Don't vibe the feelings of this world, being judgmental and everybody. Cut off insular from everybody. Show friendship and love to the people around you, and particularly to your family. Well, I have a fairly witty mind and mind that makes connections. And as I was preparing this, I thought about jo Joseph's coat. And I thought about this coat of many colors. It's thought to be also may mean a coat of many furs. But if we stick with the bright colors for the moment, what do we think of as being a bright garment? And I thought back in history. And I thought back to the, the jesters in court. And what were they called? They were called the motley fool. And what was the clothing called? It was called the motley garment, was actually what they called it, that they used to wear in the court, high colours and all these things. And I thought of this because then I thought of Jacob's brothers, and when I was a, a boy, I thought, wow, what a group of men to have the 12 tribes of Israel named after them. I thought they must have been really godly, really great men. And then I started to read my Bible with understanding, and I realised what a motley crew they were. Bad men. Sinful men. In and of themselves. Simeon and Levi cowardly tricked and murdered the men of Shechem. Judah was a whoremonger and adulterer. Reuben committed incest with his father's concubine. All of them conspired together to deceive J Jacob that Joseph was dead, I should say, except for Benjamin. And with the exception of Benjamin and Reuben, they sold Joseph as a slave to the Ishmaelites. I've known Christian families where an older brother has gone astray, the eldest son. And the eldest son then leaves a bad example to the younger brothers and they blame the eldest son for leading the younger brothers astray. But Joseph didn't follow their example. He didn't say, well, my family's treated me so badly once he got to Egypt, selling me as a slave. Imagine as they took that garment and threw him into the pit, the fear that a 17-year-old boy must have felt as that was happening. These pits at times dried out. But if it rained, he would have drowned in the midst of that pit. It was in a pit they placed the prophet Jeremiah. It was a fearful place. It was its shape, so it was impossible to climb out of. Unless somebody pulled you out, you would die. He was completely helpless at the bottom of that pit. Then they pulled him out, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites. Now, it would be convenient now, the point I'll say, well, that was his cousins. It may have been his cousins but it was a general term for other people in the area at that time. And they sold him. But Joseph didn't say, this is a reason why I'm justified to sin. You and I, we can't use the bad example of our brothers and sisters in Christ of professing Christians to justify our sin. We can't use the example of another Christian who sins openly and say, therefore, it's, if they do it, it's all right for me to do it. You can't use the example of a minister who falls morally and say, because he does it, does it, it's all right for me to do it. You can't even use the example of a minister, and God forbid that this happens, but it does. They're in the ministry, they're continuing the ministry, and they have some vice. You can't look at that man and say, that's all right for me to continue in this sin, because he does. No. No, all sin is against God. And that other person you're looking at will give an answer to God. If Christians continue in open sin for lengthy periods of time and die in that open sin, we have one answer about them, is they were never born again. We believe in the perseverance of the saints. Although a, 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 a saint may fall morally for a time like David did, they will be restored, they will repent. Repent. 
and continue in the ways of the Lord. Never use somebody else's sin as an excuse. Never use the times that we live in as an excuse for sin. The Bible is our standard. God is the standard of holiness, which we'll never achieve, but we're to strive to meet. He is the one who tells us how to please him, and he is the one we are to follow. The second seductive excuse he could have used is mistaken belief in God. After Hagar met with the angel of the Lord by the fountain of water in the wilderness, what did she say? She called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seeth me. For she said, Have I also looked after him that seeth me? And we can can translate that, that God is the God who sees. She called Jehovah the God who sees. And she seemed to think that while she was in Abraham's house with Sarah, God was there. But once she left, God was gone. Jacob left his father's house, and he had that incredible vision of the ladder reaching up to heaven. And when he awoke, he exclaimed, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And it seems that during the times of the patriarchs, that the heathen polythe- polytheists around the household of faith, that the philosophy of these people affected the families of the patriarchs. And Hagar and Jacob seem to think that when they left the household of the patriarch, they were leaving the presence of God. The heathens believed in gods of the hills and gods of the valleys and gods of the forests and gods of the seas and all these sorts of things. Local gods. They didn't know the true God. And this false thought was possibly increased by the appearance of what we call theophanies, where the angel of the Lord visited the patriarchs. Had Joseph taken such a philosophy, he could easily have succumbed to the temptations of Potiphar's wife. He could have said, Egypt, it's the world. We think of Egypt as being a type of the world, don't we? I'm in a different place. God's not here. I can do what I like. Well, Proverbs again, chapter 15, verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. It will be centuries later that the scriptures would commence to be written down. But Joseph didn't forget what he'd been taught as he grew up. Don't think you can lock yourself away in your house and sin. And God doesn't know. Don't think you can take yourself out with groups of people and sin. And God doesn't know. The eyes are of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. The third seductive excuse to sin could be his social standing. Now, when you read this passage, or the passage before this, we think of Joseph being born into Jacob's house. He's the favorite son, the son who's given the coat of many colors. He's the one likely to inherit. And in Egypt, he's just a slave. But to think of it in those ways would be overly simplistic. The Middle Eastern society at that time was a lot more complicated than we would understand it in the West today. Living with Jacob, he was living the life of a Bedouin. The Bedouin went round in their tents, a nomadic life. The black tents they used were made of goat hair. And basically they spent their time in coarse clothing and caring for their cattle, following their cattle around and moving them from pasture land to pasture land. As things went on, it was a low way of life. It was looked down on as a way of life. It was quite a humble way of life. We tend to think of it as being very different to that, don't we? But in Middle Eastern society, that was how it was looked upon. And then there was the Fellahim people that were the country folk who lived in the unwalled cities like the apostles and like David's father Jesse lived in and grew up in. And they were looked down upon as being the country folk. But then there was the Beledin people. These were the ones that lived in the walled cities. They didn't keep cattle, it was beneath them. 
and they were educated people and they wore more comfortable clothing and they wore socks in their sandals, leather socks in their sandals and sophisticated things like that. We're smiling as we think about these things. These are the things that tempted Lot and allured him to go into Sodom. When you find him falling out with Abraham and them separating, what's it over? It's over the number of cattle they've got. How many cattle did he have when he fled from Sodom? None. Because he pitched his tent towards Sodom, against Sodom, was in Sodom, sitting in the gate of Sodom. He became a sophisticant, went up in lifestyle and standards and social standing. And he was a judge there. But the men wouldn't allow him to judge them for their sin. Now Egypt would rise dramatically in its wealth and power during Joseph's life time. We know that he would be there, he'd be in prison for a number of years, and then we'd have the seven years of plenty, but then the seven years of famine. And this is when it became cemented as a nation. This is when all the nations across Africa came and they sold themselves to Pharaoh. And this is why we think of Egypt being such a wealthy country from these times then with the pyramids and everything else. But still, it was a, one of the most sophisticated populaces on earth as Joseph went there. It would have seemed sophisticated to him. Now, as a slave, he wasn't a slave for some poor family. He was sold to Potiphar, an Egyptian, who held a senior post in Egypt close to Pharaoh. And the scriptures tell us that Joseph thrived in his house. The secret is of his success in verse 2 was that the Lord was with Joseph. Now, we have a very negative view of slavery, and I don't believe in slavery, so don't please get me wrong in what I'm going to say to you now. This isn't a justification of slavery at all. But the slavery that Joseph was in was very different to what we think of from North America of the 19th century and the 18th century. And it was quite a great style. The civil service of these countries was often made up of slaves, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were slaves in Babylon. And as he's there, he's only a teenage lad, 17 or 18 years of age, possibly 19, in Potiphar's house. And he was prosperous. God was blessing him. He was successful. And although the Bible says his master saw that the Lord was with him, it doesn't necessarily mean that Potiphar believed in Jehovah. It means he liked what he saw. He could see the effects of that blessing. That Basically, anything he touched turned to gold. He had that Midas touch, as we talk about. He had the blessing of God, and everything was prospering. That he was engaged in. Potiphar, being a wise man, thought, well, I want a piece of this, and I'll promote him, because it will do me good. And the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So blessed by God was Joseph that he was made the overseer of Potiphar's house. His house was blessed by his presence in verse 5. He was up and coming. He was doing very well. Oh, we could be tempted, can't we, with pride in such a situation, particularly at such a young age, to be promoted so quickly. But despite being cut off from family, being far from home and still a teenager, he wasn't overtaken with pride or taking up with the excitement of this new life. He still feared God. Well, the other seductive excuse for sin he could have used is the abuse of power. Being the wife of his master, Joseph could have been inclined to yield to her advances out of fear. As the wife of the master, she held considerable power over him, and we see that in this chapter, don't we? What she was able to do to him. And he would have been right to have feared her. Look at the trouble she caused him. But he wouldn't give in out of fear. My friend, fear is never an excuse to sin. If you feel fear when you're standing, read God's word. Pray. I was talking to my wife. We've got a difficulty at the moment. And she's been quite cast down about it. And I recommended she read a particular book. She'd read that a bit. And she turned to one of Spurgeon's readings today. And that encouraged her a lot. And my wife I spoke to this afternoon was very different to the wife I spoke to this morning. Because she took her confidence from God. My friend, if you're going to serve God, 
If you're going to take on Satan, if you're going to take on the world, don't try and do it in your own strength. You're going to be splattered in a second. We wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We aren't strong enough to take on Satan. We aren't strong enough to take on the evil spirits. We need the omnipotent God that reigneth forever to help us. He does so through the indwelling and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We're not to do wrong out of fear. I was showing a hymn, or quoting a hymn um, the other day to somebody, and there's a verse in it, I think it's by William Cooper. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Isn't that the truth? Well, my friend, when the weakest saint invokes the power of the omnipotent God, one of us can chase a thousand. There's no one that can stand in our way. You think of the promises given to Joshua as he took over the people of Israel that no man could stand before him. Why? Because he had the anointing of God upon him. And it's only when Achan sinned and he stopped praying that defeat was found in the valley of Achor. Whilst he walked with the Lord, whilst he prayed, he was never defeated. He went on and carried on. Oh, how we need the Lord to help us in these situations. Our second heading this evening is the superb example for us when we're tempted to sin. We read concerning Rachel, Joseph's mother, that she was beautiful and well-favoured, Genesis 29, 17. And it seems that Joseph may well have taken after her in his looks because he was similarly blessed. Verse 6, we would see he was a goodly person and well-favoured. Now, when it comes to the Bible, we get a little bit of interesting contradictions. I say contradictions in the loosest sense of the word. Proverbs 31 tells us that favour is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that favoureth the Lord, she shall be praised. Which, is, if we took this in isolation, might, we might think of that looks are a curse rather than a blessing. But then we read in the last chapter of Job, as God's blessing Job with a second family, in all the land there were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brethren. We read, don't we, later on of Absalom. And he's described in 2 Samuel 14, 25, in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Well, that's an unusual way of describing a men, man for us today. We don't tend to talk about men being beautiful, do we? If I said to Peter tonight, well, Peter, you're a beautiful man. He might not be too chuffed. He might be thinking, what you're saying? If I said, oh, Peter, you're very pretty tonight, he definitely wouldn't be chuffed. And I said, Sandy, you're very pretty. Peter would even be less chuffed still. So we, we have differences in phrases here, don't we? But it wasn't an unusual thing in the Old Testament times to talk about a man and his beauty. He was a handsome man, a good-looking man. He was a highly intelligent man, a capable man. He was a likable man. Most of Israel followed him in his rising up against David. There was so much in him to see, to like. There was no blemish in him. Do you know I have a blemish? I have a brown birthmark on my shoulder. My father had the same birthmark. His father had the same birthmark, and John has the same birthmark. It comes there. They're all in slightly different places on us. We all have a blemish, so we know Absalom's, I can tell you that. And I certainly cut my hair more than once a year. But the sad thing about Absalom was he became lifted up with pride. His beauty would ultimately be his undoing. He took great pride in that hair of his, didn't he? And how did he become entangled in the tree? By his hair. And Jacob came, Joab came along and rightly killed him by casting the darts through him, through his treason. Absalom's sister Tamar is also described as being fair. and She attracted the unwelcome attention of her half-brother Amnon, and was raped by Amnon. So beauty can be a great temptation to us. It can lift us up in pride. It can attract unwanted attention like Tamar and Joseph did. 
And Joseph, we read, being an attractive young man, caught the eye of Potiphar's wife, verse 7. Now, we're not told anything about this woman. We're not told how old she was. Her looks aren't described. But there's no reason to think she may have only been around the age of Joseph or slightly older. But with the sophistication that we know the Egyptians lived with, with the care of their appearance and the use of makeup, she could have looked much younger than she was. And this could have been a very great trial for poor Joseph. Her lustful desire was to commit adultery with him. And look at how determined she was. My father warned me growing up, he said, the most attractive woman is one who shows, a, shows desire towards you, shows that she's attracted to you. And he was right. He was right. Despite possibly feeling himself to be lonely and having the strong physical desires of a young man, he resisted this concupiscent temptress, and it was a terrible temptation. I think we miss just how great a temptation this was to a teenage lad. Verse 10 tells us that day by day she attempted to persuade him. Having failed to convince him to commit adultery with her, she sought to ensnare him by enticing him to be with her. He was, he realized, she realized that the direct approach wouldn't work. So she wanted to form an emotional bond with Joseph, spend time with him, and draw him in, soften him up, ready to make him to fall morally. Now, Peter and I, we were single for quite a long time. I didn't get married until I was 32. I think Peter was a bit older than me when he got married. And there were times when I was very lonely. I can't know how Peter was, but I was very lonely. And I was working in secular work, and I worked in IT and call centers. And believe me, my salary was a lot higher than most of the staffs that worked there. And so from time to time, it would attract, I would attract the attentions of young women that I worked with. And one woman I remember um, came from Muslim background, and she started talking to me in the hallways and corridors. I was very friendly. She was an attractive person to look at. She was a nice person. And she started telling me about her difficulties in her life and all these sorts of things. So I, I quite enjoyed listening to her and talking to her. And she was somebody who drew out empathy from me for the situations she'd been through. And I realized the only thing between me not getting involved with her and not sinning and falling with her was a cup of coffee. You might be saying, well, Charles, that's a bit strong. Are you really that weak? Well, no, let me, let me show you the logic here. I like to talk to people. I like to listen to people. And the, the natural thing for me would be to have said to this young woman, let's go to the canteen and get a cup of coffee. So you start meeting for cups of coffee and chatting like that, and it goes nicely. Then you think, well, let's meet up after work and we can talk some more. I'll buy you dinner. And out you go for dinner. And that goes nicely and you get on very well. And of course, the natural inclination is to do that a few times. At what point then do you get out? At what point then when do you stop? You're enticed. You're emotionally drawn in. You've already compromised. You're spending time with an unbeliever. And I realized the only way to be careful, the only way to be sure of not getting involved in an unsuitable relationship was just don't have a cup of coffee with her. And that worked. And I'm not saying to you be ridiculously legalistic in these things. I'm saying think about what you're doing. Keep your wits about you. But you can be enticed. Joseph had his wits about him. He wouldn't get an emotional relationship with this woman. He wouldn't form any sort of relationship with him. And Potiphar's wife seized the possibly rare opportunity of when they were alone in the house to force herself on Joseph. The historian Josephus, and in no way do we put this on a level with Scripture at all, it may give us a helpful insight or not, wrote of how the men were attending a public festival and that the wife pretended to be ill. That may or may not be the case. It certainly is an interesting thought in it. But we find in verses 12 and 13, her lust reached a violent apogee as she took hold 
of Joseph's garment. She's becoming physical with Joseph. She wants to take hold of Joseph. She wants her way with Joseph. You know, this is how lust is. This is how lust is. Picture the men of Sodom banging on the house, at the house of Lot, wanting to rape the young men there. Picture the concubine raped to death in, in, in judges. The violence of lust, the violence of sin. Look around the streets of our nation today. The huge numbers of rapes and sexual assaults and violent crime. Lust is at a violent apogee, apogee in our society. And do you think you're any different for the worst criminals in this land in terms of the capability of what sin could lower you to? You're very deceived if you think you're different. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have a totally depraved nature. You know, we have a dog at home. He's quite old now. But when we got him, it was nine years ago. My son John was only a toddler at that stage, and Sarah was, I don't know, probably five, six. <clears throat> I said to my wife, any signs of aggression from this dog, he goes. Now, he is a completely soppy creature. He's got long hair. He's the sweetest dog you could ever meet. He's a terrific guard dog. At the first sign of trouble, he runs behind my legs and shakes like a leaf and expects me to protect him. Vicious creature he is. But if I told you what that dog was, he's part Jack Russell, which is the cute little dogs for hunting rats, and part of the part he favours is the Patterdale Terrier. Now, most people haven't heard of Patterdale Terriers. They come from up in Cumbria. Although he's got short legs, when he was young, he could run really fast. They're sprinting dogs. And these dogs were bred to chase down, catch, and kill a fox. It's about the same size as them. So this terrier, made to be a hunting dog, is a vicious creature that will kill a fox. And I've seen a YouTube video of a Patterdale Terrier hanging by its teeth for two minutes. Now, if I'd encouraged Monty to be that hunting Patterdale, if he had that in him, he wouldn't be a suitable dog for my toddler son to cuddle. My son was there yesterday wrestling with him on the floor. He's as soft as anything. We got a kitten back in September, a lovely tabby kitten. The kitten was this long. He weighed... Uh, 600 grams, and Monty was about 12 kilos. Monty wanted to be friendly with him. He's wagging his tail and really happy, wanted to go meet him. And little Bernie, when he first took a look at a dog, I think Monty was the first one he did. He arched his back and spat in Monty's face. And over the next week or so, they became great pals and great friends. And you can see that they played together, and not once has the kitten cried. The kitten's getting to be as, almost as big as the dog now, but that's the way it goes. I want a dog that's kind, that's soft. And old Monty, he couldn't catch a cold, let alone anything there. And he's not aggressive to the family. That's the dog you want for a pet. That's the dog you want in your nature. As a Christian, you've got two natures. You've got one that wants to sin. You've got one that hates God. You've got one that hates righteousness. And you've got the new nature that loves God, that hates sin, and loves righteousness. And if you pursue lust and the pleasures of the flesh, the old man will strengthen and overpower the new, and you'll fall into sin. And if you encourage the new one, and you live a life of prayer and sanctification, well, then you have the promise of the Holy Spirit's help to overcome sin and temptation, like Joseph did. Or, he could have got mixed up in this situation about what was the right thing to do. You could say 1 Thessalonians 5.22 states that we should abstain from all appearance of evil. But when you're being tempted to commit open sin like he was, and gross open sin at this, 
Don't worry about the appearance at that stage. Just get out. Get away from it. Don't think that committing the sin is better because nobody will know about it. Joseph did the only thing he could. He fled and got him out. And it meant he had to leave naked as she grabbed his garment. That was still better than submitting to sin. We can only imagine how as this young lad, his pulse must have been pounding in his veins. His desires would have been so aroused by the situation. We're apt to think of these characters, aren't we? In a way that, oh, this was no temptation to him. No, he wanted. He had it everything in his power he could have done to commit sin with her. He was a normal man. He went on to marry and have children. We know that. Genesis tells us. No, he overcame. Even if it meant the shame of being stripped naked. But if the house was empty, this was a small price to pay. But finally, the shameful event which followed. Scorned by Joseph, Potiphar's wife wanted vengeance. Verse 16 tells us that she kept his garments as an evidence to prove the lies that she would tell. You can imagine how unjust it felt for Joseph to be cast into prison. You can imagine how low he may have felt. But there's one thing he could have done as he lay his head down that night. He knew he'd done the right thing. He knew he'd done the right thing. Let me tell you now, it's better to have a good conscience and lay your head down on a prison pillow than it is to have a bad one, a guilty one, and lay your head down on the pillow in a palace. Much better. And we see in verse 21 the reason why he's still being blessed by God. How this flies in the face of human reason. Human reason said God was blessing him when he was up and coming in, in Joseph's house, in Potiphar's house. Human reason would say he was favored in the house of Jacob and say, that's when you're being blessed by God. Being blessed by God. Now you're in the prison. How can you be blessed by God? But God still continues to bless him. What does Peter tell us in 1 Peter 3 from verse 13? Who is he that will harm you? If you be followers of that which is good, but as if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that's asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well doing. This is a founding principle of the Christian church. Uh, what is the foundation of the church? Well, the first foundation of the church in that sense is Christ, and we don't dispute that at all. The New Testament also teaches us that it's the apostles and their doctrine, and here is the doctrine of the apostles, the teachings of Christ that are telling us you're better to suffer for being a Christian. You're better to suffer for doing the right thing, for being righteous, than, and keeping your good conscience than you are to sin. You are to sin. We're living in a day when it's becoming very difficult for the Christian. I was talking to my pastor a short time ago about this very issue and how he and I, and possibly Peter as well, if things continue going as badly as they've been going in recent years, it's very likely that we could go to prison for preaching the truth that we've had the freedoms to preach up till now. Very likely that that could happen. I know Christians have quit their jobs because of the ways that businesses are going, that they'd rather quit than do wrong. And it's possible that persecution is coming. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul wrote, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The freedoms that we've enjoyed as Christians in this land have been a unique and a temporary thing in the history of the world. They are not common. This is not how the world normally is. The world is normally hostile to the believer in Jehovah. 
And the believer in Jehovah has a difficult life. And we need to take simple pictures like Joseph, whether it's the sin and immorality like he did. We're going to have faced choices in the next few years if we're going to live in this world. Do I take a stand or do I compromise? Do I please Christ or do I keep my head down and hide, put my light under a bushel as it's called in the New Testament? Jesus said, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. And if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city which is set on a hill cannot be hid. Do you want to know why sin abounds in, the, in our society today? I will tell you why. Because Christians in this country heard cursing and berated it not, as we're taught in Scripture. They heard swearing, they heard blasphemy. They didn't speak out about it in the workplace. I remember growing up hearing on the news about um, Mrs. Whitehouse and her stand for things, and she stood alone as a maverick, and she was seen to stand alone, and many Christians used to mock her, stand against the immorality coming on our televisions. And Christian homes had things on the television they shouldn't have had, and I don't mean nudity and things like that, the extremes of things that are available. Things like soap operas and things like that. And they wondered where their daughters developed eating disorders, copying their children that were portrayed on the screen. Christian families today wonder why. Why has my son, why has my daughter become a homosexual? Because I've watched these things that normalize these things in films and dramas and television. They haven't separated themselves from the world. You want to know why homosexual marriage has become a thing in this country? It's because when the laws were changed to allow divorce, and the laws were changed to recognize common law relationships on the same level of marriage, Christians were silent in this land. It's astonishing. We hear the protests of the Muslims in London in recent weeks over Gaza. Where were the protests of Christians since the Second World War? Standing up. There were more Christians in this country than Muslims at that time. And they didn't speak out. They didn't declare the sin. They didn't speak out against the sin. They didn't make sure that good men were put into Parliament and bad men kept out. That's why sin abounds today. That's why morality has come. This, we are reaping what we've sown over decades as the Lord's people in this country. And we need to wake up today. We need to be like Joseph. We need to be like the other men in Scripture who when they're placed at the time of testing, they don't fold, they don't crumple, they don't make excuses. What does he say to the woman? How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The next time you're tempted to sin, you might think it's a small thing. Do you know, in the Old Testament, I can't remember the reference, there was a man who gathered sticks on the Sabbath to make a fire. And he was put to death. It was seen as great wickedness. My friend, all sin is wicked. And it's wicked people who commit sin. 
The next time you're tempted to fall into sin, think of Joseph's words. Ask this rhetorical question. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The next time you have opportunity to witness the gospel, and there's a temptation within to keep silent, ask yourself that question. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The next time you're tempted not to give your life to him, to spend time in vanity and sin and worldly entertainments rather than do something beneficial to your soul, ask yourself this question. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And trust God to bless you. More than the approbation of men. Think of the glories and splendor of heaven. Read of the rewards that are there for all eternity where the tears will be taken out of your eyes. And you'll be forever with the Lord. And realize how short life is in comparison to the length of eternity. Amen.